So Andrew Mitrak uh, is here to, to talk to us about adventures in haptics, VR, and tactile telerobots. That sounds really exciting. Can <laughs> robots touch? And can, do they know how to touch? So I'm going to leave the rest of the talk to you. Please welcome Andrew Mitrak. Yeah. Thank you, Sandra, and thanks everybody for being here. I know it's um, a beautiful day outside and there's no lunch here, so uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm really happy that you all came in. Um, yeah, as, Andrew, as, as uh, Sandra said, like I'm, my name's Andrew Mitrak. I work with a company called Haptex. Um, I've been with them for a few years, and this, um, as director of marketing at Haptex, I get to introduce a lot of people to, to touch in VR, and I get to learn a lot about how people would like to use touch in VR. So it's been a very interesting um, entry point into the VR industry, and along the way, I've learned a lot about touch and, and other forms of haptic feedback, and virtual reality, and as Sandra said, telerobots as well. So um, yeah, for this presentation, we're gonna give a little bit of background about, well, first, a brief introduction about me, some of my, how I got into this uh, strange adventure, um, a, a background on what touch actually is. You know, we all have a sense of touch, but we probably don't think about it all that often. Um, some of the developments in haptics over the past 40 years or so and, and kind of where the state of the haptic industry is and how Haptex, uh, the company I work with, how they're kind of taking a different approach to, to haptic feedback. And I um, you know, saved a section for Q&A at the end, but please um, ask questions, make comments throughout the presentation. It's much more interesting that way for everybody. So a little bit about me. Uh, <laughs> These are my cats, Biscuit and Butters. Uh, I live with them in Seattle. Uh, my, my wife uh, actually runs an Instagram account for them. Uh, you can follow them at uh, officially Biscuit and Butters. Um, and I also like to shamelessly uh, use uh, cute animals uh, throughout uh, VR experiences and presentations to uh, try to make things a little more fun and interesting. Um, <laughs> Um, how I got into haptics uh, and virtual reality um, kind of starts with my interest in film. Um, in, when, in 2008, when I was just entering college, these uh, uh, DSLR cameras were just starting to be able to shoot really good video. Um, and meanwhile, kind of technology intersecting with storytelling, uh, YouTube was just starting to be able to embed HD video. And this is a really, I think, a really magical combination of, you know, I could shoot a lot of video, tell stories, do little journalism pieces, and publish them immediately. And when I was at the University of Washington in Seattle, I helped create a, a webcast for the student newspaper. Um, you know, this, this is awesome because it got me into, uh, you know, free football games where I got to be on the field and all that, so that was a lot of fun. Um, and that ended up turning into a, a TV show uh, for, for the campus. Um, and you know, I was, wanted to be a student journalist, but I kind of quickly realized there's no money in journalism. So I started doing a lot of uh, advertising and promotional videos. You know, companies in Seattle like, like Microsoft, AT&T, there's an investment company out there. They, they realized, oh, they could spend a bunch of money on, um, they used to have to spend all this money for an advertisement, but now you know, with some college filmmaker, they could work um, using a DSLR camera and, and for, uh, a much lower cost, they can put their advertisements or pro promotional videos on YouTube. So that's what I was doing. And in the meantime, on the weekends, I was, had all these film projects, um, kind of the, the weekend warrior uh, sort of filmmaker doing uh, short films and documentaries and music videos and trying to get those into film festivals. Um, but as you, you're probably aware, a lot of people want to be filmmakers. Uh, there's a lot of competition in there. Uh, I was joking with Sandra, you kind of have to you know, be a little bit delusional to think that you can be a real successful independent filmmaker because uh, it's a very, very crowded market. So I was looking for the next frontier um, of something, what's the, what's the new thing that's coming and how could I be different? And I, I tried the Oculus Rift DK2 in uh, 2014 at, at the San Diego Comic Con. Um, I'm a total nerd, so I'm always going to comic conventions as well. And there's this amazing Pacific Rim VR experience. Uh, was, uh, Guillermo del Toro was involved with it. And you got to you know, be inside this giant mechanical robot as the person controlling it. And it was just totally out of this world. I hadn't experienced anything like it. I, I waited three hours in line at Comic-Con to try this. And it was only a three minute experience, but it was totally worth the wait. Um, and I kind of, I just got the VR bug. Um, in Seattle, there's this vibrant uh, VR meetup community. Has anybody gone to the Boston VR meetup around here? 
Um, is how how is it? Is it like a cool like? Is it? It's popular. Uh, it's popular. Yeah, and I found that like meetups are, especially a few years ago in VR, when people didn't have headsets at home, or most people didn't. You could go here, and people would you know share the experience, and it was this very sort of grassroots way of evangelizing VR. And it's I found just a wonderful community in in Seattle. And if you haven't been to a Boston VR meetup, I definitely check out meetup.com and, and try to just meet some people and try new VR experiences. Um, so, so people at the meetup group taught me how to make 360 videos and this is when you found somebody with a 3D printer to make a special GoPro rig and have 10 different GoPros together and you'd film something but one of the GoPros would overheat and, and you'd lose a chunk of the video and then all, you'd have to spend hours trying to stitch things together. Um, so it was very clunky but I, I learned a lot about you know, early 360 video filmmaking. Um, and along the way, I, I, through those meetup groups and through referrals, I learned about this stealthy VR startup that was called Axon VR at the time. We're now called Haptex. And, um, and I was just really drawn to this company that was, you know, had this really ambitious, full body, fully immersive virtual reality vision. Uh, basically, it was founded by a 20 year old kid who wanted to build the Star Trek holodeck. Uh, <laughs> And I'm like, well, this, I don't know if this startup will succeed, but it sounds like it'll be a fun adventure. And it was only a team of 12 engineers and they didn't have any marketing people. They had, I think, only one other non-engineer at the company. And so I said, okay, I'll, I'll join this and I'll, I'll you know, help kind of tell their story. And it's been a few years since then. Um, and through that, I've shared these gloves that we build with people and I've learned a lot about haptic feedback and a lot about how uh, people in VR want to use haptic gloves uh, and other kind of peripheral devices. Um, along with working at Haptex, I'm also the chair of the XR Accessories Group at the uh, Consumer Technology Association. Uh, they're the group that runs CES, the, the big electronics show in Las Vegas every year. And through that, I've also gotten to meet a lot of other people who work in the peripherals category, working on accessories, learning about standards for input and control within VR. Um, and what's kind of amazing is, and where I met Sandra, uh, was at the Sundance Film Festival. We, um, uh, you know, as the first, as one of the few, you know, storytellers at the company that I'm at, um, I got to be heavily involved with making our demonstrations, you know, the, the, the demos that we show to highlight our, our, the capabilities of our technology. And what I find so interesting about this is, you know, back here, you know, I was dreaming of going to a place like Sundance. And by getting into VR, I thought I was kind of giving up on that dream. Um, but it was only, you know, through getting into VR, I actually had a much better chance of going to a place like Sundance. Um, and so I, I guess it kind of shows that, you know, a lot of things are possible in this industry and sometimes, you know, there are these roundabout, unexpected ways um, of, of, you know, pursuing a big uh, a dream of yours. Uh, so that was a lot of fun as well. So that's all I'm going to say about me. Uh, <laughs> and I'm going to move on to talking about um, touch because really understanding what haptic feedback is capable of we want to have a, a sense of, of uh, how we perceive touch. And I guess the most important thing about touch is that touch really matters. Um, and to illustrate that, I'm going to play a video. Um, this is an experiment by Roland Johansson out of Sweden. Um, and this is somebody performing a simple task, striking a match with the sense of touch. I'm sure most of us in this room have actually done that before. I'm going to warn you, there's, they're going to apply some anesthetic uh, to this person's hand and remove the sense of touch. So if you don't like needles, look away for about 10 seconds because there's going to be a nasty needle uh, coming in here. There it is. <laughs> so this person will still have um, full dexterity of her hand. Uh, she'll be able to see and have her visuals. Um, but she's going to go through uh, that same uh, simple task of striking a match without the sense of touch. Let's just watch how that goes. Kind of painful to watch, actually. <laughs> there we go. And success. All right. See how easy that is without touch. Um, isn't that incredible? Like I mean, we we sort of take touch for granted. Uh, that it's almost hard to think of uh, imagining a world without touch. Um, and there are a bunch of other examples. You know, if you're 
taking notes on an iPad on a, on a glass screen, you're going to type much less efficiently than if you're typing on a mechanical keyboard. Um, and that's just because of the lack of you know, the, the nice click you feel with, with haptic feedback. Uh, similarly, like one of the most frustrating things I ever experienced is when I'm at a doorbell and I'm you know, touching the doorbell but I can't hear whether it's ringing inside and I'm not feeling the button click. Uh, have you ever experienced that? It's, like, it's a very frustrating thing because you feel like you might have to ring the doorbell a bunch of times. So, so haptics are really important to the way that we uh, perform tasks. Um, but beyond just the way we perform tasks or, or, or about efficiency or productivity, Touch is also something that's very emotional to people. I mean, if you think of the way we use touch in our language, you could say you're touched by somebody's thoughtfulness, or that something rubs you the wrong way, or somebody has coarse language or a prickly personality. Um, he's a tactless diplomat. You know, tactless meaning literally lacking the sense of touch means that somebody isn't emotionally cued. And and you know, they and what do we call feelings? You know, that's what that's um, emotions or feelings. And you know, we call emotions feelings, not sightings or tastings or hearings or smellings. Um, so touch is just really ingrained in our language as something that's really emotionally important. And I think it could be very important to the way we, we tell and experience stories as well. Um, but what is touch? Um, you know, we obviously know that it's one of our five senses, um, but touch itself is more than just one sensation alone. Um, really, you know, touch is made up of, of a number of sensory modalities and, and sensations. Um, the first sensation is that sense of tactile pressure. If you have that, um, like a water bottle or any object in front of you and you touch it, you can see that your skin actually indents, right? And that you're actually feeling something because your skin tightens. And you have re these receptors that are about, you know, uh, two millimeters or so beneath the surface of your skin that gives you that sense of tactile feedback. And that sense of tactile feedback is something that's very important. It's, it's present in just about every touch interaction you'll do in your life. And with that is force feedback. Going back to this, this water bottle example, um, my hand doesn't go through it like it's a hologram. It's, it stops around the edges of it. And so I'm feeling that force feedback as well as tension. And if I'm picking something and I have a sense of weight, I'm feeling that force feedback on, on my arm and even in my back. Uh, where I'm, I'm picking something up. So it gives you a sense of shape, weight, and firmness. Finally, there's vibro, vibrotactile. Um, you know, you've probably experienced haptic vibrotactile with your phone if you set it to vibrate before. But vibrate can also, vibration can be much more nuanced than that. It gives you a sense of textures, whether something's rough or smooth. Um, that, that sense of, um, of Vibrotactile feedback is actually a, a sound wave that is traveling through a solid object against the surface of your skin. So it's, it's operating at different frequencies, giving you a sense of different textures. Um, then there's thermal feedback. How do I know whether my water is hot or cold? Um, it's actually the perception of heat flux. So um, a metal object will be actually the same absolute temperature as a wooden object in the same room. But the metal, uh, it's thermally conductive, so it's sucking the heat out of your, out of your hand, uh, and you perceive it as being colder. So that, that, that um, simulation of heat flux is also important to the sense of touch. And then finally, of course, there's pain and itch. And this alerts you if there's something wrong, or if you're in danger, or if you should seek medical treatment. Um, it's it, uh, it's um, rare for haptics to simulate this. Uh, we will actually show an example of <laughs> haptics simulating that in a moment. Um, but each of these works together uh, to create touch sensations. And again, uh, I like using cute little animals to illustrate it. So a, a hedgehog would demonstrate that something is, uh, is uh, you know, prickly, and that's, that's tactile feedback. It lets you know that it's a, a prickly hedgehog. Force feedback, if you're high-fiving a dog, it gives you that sense of, uh, of force against your hand. Um, vibro, that, that lets you know that your, your cat's tongue is, um, is rough rather than smooth. Um, Thermal it lets you know this cute little puppy is warm, and um, pain and itch it lets you know you've been stung by a bee, and you should uh, get that stinger out. And what's interesting about this is all, in all of these, you know, there's one dominant modality. Uh, taking the warm puppy for example, there's there's that sense of warmth, but there, you're also feeling that tactile pressure on your skin, uh, and you're also feeling force feedback in its weight. So so there can be a dominant modality, but really it's about the blending of these that creates um, touch sensations. 
what is, so what is, uh, that's all about touch. Uh, what about haptics? Um, I'm guessing most of us in this room have heard of haptic feedback before. Yeah? Um, you know, it's the, haptics as a category is the science and technology of touch um, and all of those modalities that I just described. Um, and I point out that it's not just vibration. Um, and the reason I emphasize that is that most haptic uh, products uh, that we've interface throughout our days, most of them are just vibration alone. Um, if we look at the past 40 years or so of haptic products, uh, this here uh, is the Sega Fons. It was the first, uh, as far as I've, I can tell based on research, um, it's the first arcade uh, video game to feature uh, haptic feedback. Uh, do people remember Happy Days in, in the Fons? Uh, yeah, <laughs> okay, Henry Winkler, yeah. Um, so he, you know, Fonz, Fonzie rode a motorcycle, and this is a really great illustration of haptics. You're operating this game, you're holding the handlebars, and you're feeling the rumble and the vibration as you play this game, and it really immerses you into the experience as you're controlling this, this motorcycle. Um, and um, since then, you know, haptics has been integrated into a number of video games. This is a, the first pinball machine to feature haptic feedback. Um, you know, the Nintendo 64 Rumble Pack, that was probably my first experience with uh, haptic feedback, where you're, you can play Mario Kart and it'll, um, if you're, you run into a wall or crash into an opponent, um, your, your controller will rumble. And, um, you know, things like the iPhone and, and uh, Apple Watch, they're, they're useful for using uh, haptics for alerts. And the, in most of those scenarios, um, the haptic feedback that's being used, I, I think of it as being symbolic in nature. The Mario Kart example, it doesn't really feel like you were in the car and you got into a, cra uh, a car crash. It, it just is more of, of a symbolic, you're off the field or you're, you've been damaged and it's symbolizing and notifying you that something's gone wrong. Similar with a, a, a phone call or some notification, um, it, it's symbolizing that something's happening. And where I'd position Haptex and the Novant Falcon as well, uh, they're devices that are trying to move beyond just vibration to simulate multiple modalities to not do symbolic haptics, but go for realistic haptics. Haptics that, that don't try to symbolize an object, but try to recreate the object in and of itself. Um, the Novant Falcon, you could often use it as a, a pen-like tool and you can move your hand uh, at about you know, six inches in any direction and you can feel a sense of force feedback uh, so it's, it's very limited by the, the number of things it can simulate because it's not often that you're holding a pen and moving it only this much, but it's it, in the right context, it can recreate um, the real world experience. And uh, with our gloves, which I'll get into in more detail, uh, we're trying to recreate a number of different haptic modalities to create a sense of uh, realistic experience. And then we want to be able to enable you to use your hand naturally rather than holding a plastic controller so you can use your hand in the, in the real world, or in the virtual world, the same way you'd use it in the real world. Um, so between uh, my job at Haptex and, and my role with the CTA, I, I really try to just get my hands into all of the haptics I can try. Uh, this is uh, some, you know, some things I've tried at different conferences, at, like CES and South by Southwest. Um, this here is a, a vest from a company called B Haptics. Uh, has anybody ever tried a, a haptic vest? Yeah, uh, what was it like? Uh, effect, in terms of putting pressure on, effect. <clears throat> yeah, and it was, a little claustrophobic. Even. Okay, so what was the what was the experience that you did with it? Just a, a trade show, and they were, it was just a demo. It was a demo where they ran through. In this case, it was pressure, and it was I think even impact. Okay, yeah, like when I tried this one, what the experience was like shooting a gun, or robots were shooting things at me, and it would, it would vibrate when it when it hit, yeah, and so it's. Like Vibration. It's going to be a yeah. little bug, like yeah. in marshmallow yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah, for me it was a, I was in Syria, it was a bombing. Right, um, was that the hero yeah. VR experience? Uh, or was no, the, it was oh. the uh, non-Europeanian okay. in Syria. Okay, okay. Okay. Okay, sure. Yeah, um, and, and it can, that, that sense of vibration, especially in the right context, if it's, um, there's been some attack and there's, you know, big explosions and you're feeling the vibration, it can really help trick your brain uh, in certain ways um, to around that. To to, yeah. Place, 
to connect it. Yeah. The marshmallow laser piece with the backpack that vibrates. Yeah. So is that like a sub pack or something like a vibration sub -pack, backpack? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, sub pack, and then you were being a, a bug that flies away. So whenever you hear the wings fly away, your back is vibrating. Nice. Good. So sound waves. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so these ones on the left here are all different forms. They have, um, their mode of haptics is vibration based. And the, the one on the right here, I'll show a video of it in a moment. It's actually, um, it's a, a unique one that does electric shock based uh, haptics. Um, and, and so all of these, I, I, I think a lot of cool people in the industry um, are recognizing that touch and input, um, they're things that need to be solved. Um, where I think a lot of them um, you know, kind of somewhat fall short is that they're only addressing one modality, uh, usually vibration. Um, and the reason is that vibration mo motors are so abundant. You know, we produce millions and millions of cell phones that all have vibration motors. They, they've become very commoditized and they're easy to kind of take that and put it into uh, some sort of haptic device, uh, which is very useful in terms of keeping your cost down for device, but it's somewhat limited in, in that it can only recreate so many sensations, uh, primarily that vibration sensation. Um, but let's go to this one on the right here. It's called the Tesla suit. I tried this at um, South by Southwest. So, so somebody off screen is pressing a button and shocking me, uh, which convulses my muscles. Um, I, I mentioned how most haptic companies don't go for pain and itch. Uh, this is one of the rare examples. Um, and this is, uh, my colleague shot this accidentally in slow motion, but I'm very glad she did this. Is, uh, that, is that a physical shock or a yeah. electrical shock? Yeah, so there's my <laughs> genuine shock reaction. That's operating at about 70% capacity. I don't want to dream of trying 100. Um, so, so say that again. What's uh, that? Physical shock or electrical shock? Um, electro shock. So it's using EMS, electro must, yeah, exactly. So it's something, you know, EMS has been used in... Uh, physical therapy before some people I think the the science around it is dubious but or there's there's there are different um, opinions about it but some there are, I know I've talked to some performers who swear by it who say electromuscular stimulus is um, is a useful way to uh, they train they do a hard workout and then they do some some EMS onto those muscle groups um, that's usually under um, some uh, experienced supervision and it's very delicate uh, this this one, um, I really hope they don't ever kill anybody with this, because uh, because it is it is something where it is it was a very visceral shock and, and it was quite painful. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, definitely try that one at your own risk. But it felt like a shock. It didn't feel like you were being touched or pushed or, or, yeah. or hit or something. It felt like you were being zapped. Exactly. So it can do a, a, a mix of, if, they, if it's a lighter thing, it can do kind of a, a pringly, like, um, like you've just kind of a, a numbing kind of sensation where, where something's kind of tickling in a way. Um, another, like, but that example I was, I had, you know, fired a weapon and was trying to simulate the recoil and it just, you know, straight up kind of shocked and convulsed my muscles and got me to kind of Go like that. Um, it is. I, um, yeah. So I think that there's some category of masochistic gamers who would want to try that out, and then also maybe like military training potentially. I could see some um, applications of it, but um, it, it's not. It probably wouldn't be my go-to method for simulating um, haptic feedback. <laughs> um, so. So of those, our, our company has taken, you know, Haptex and most haptic researchers, um, they, we actually research very, you know, a lot into not um, um, trying to avoid ever uh, giving anybody a sense of pain. Um, because it's, it's something that ethically we just don't want to do. Uh, but we are really looking at um, trying to simulate all these other sensory channels and modalities into, um, into a single device. Um, the reason that we think of trying to go for all of these is, is uh, we want to achieve this, what we call this full spectrum of touch. And the idea is that similar to how cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, they can blend together in a printer to create almost the full color spectrum, right? That, that most of what our eyes can see or the colors that we can see are really achieved through blending uh, just a few primary colors um, to produce other colors. 
And, and we think that tactile force, vibration, and thermal, those can combine to create almost any touch sensation, short of the kind of sensations that would cause you pain. Um, so before I, I dive in more to Haptex, um, there are just two books that I want to recommend, both on this one is called Touch. It's by David Linden, and it's all about how we perceive touch. Um, and then uh, Archaeologies of Touch by David Parisi, so two Davids here. Uh, that's a really good one on the history of haptics. Um, and I found them, there's a lot of um, you know, white papers or research articles on, uh, you know, on, on haptic feedback that are much more dense. Um, these ones I found to be a very accessible primer uh, on the overall categories. Can I just ask a question? Uh -huh. So if you think of the other senses, they're all pretty much touch-based as well. What we yeah. hear is sound waves, you know, sound waves vibrating the drum, yeah. smell, olfactory. So they're all kind of also touch. Yeah. To what extent are you, so those raise interesting category questions about yeah. this touch, everything that's not those other things we've sectored off. But do, they seem to work in tandem a little bit. Like if I hear Absolutely. a buzz, I can, if I hear the right level of hurts, I can actually almost feel it too. And do you play with those? Well, Abs we'll Absolutely. Like for example, exactly. Like, for example, um, it's it's really a compounding effect that it's um, um, when you combine sight, sound, and touch. It's not one plus one equals three, or one plus one plus one equals three. It's it's something more than that. It's uh, you, you combine those, and it's kind of the whole is greater than the sum of its parts when it comes to to tricking your brain. Um, that sound is very important to touch. That there are studies that say if I'm clicking a button and, I, and it feels the exact same, but I'm hearing, I'm hearing a, a hard click versus a, a squishy click, it'll, people report it as feeling different. Um, and, and that um, you can really, um, and then you know, haptics without sound, um, it's, not, it's actually not as effective. Uh, that, that sound is a very important part of it. Uh, same with visuals. Our, um, you know, our haptics, um, an example, it's if you were, um, say, a, a blind person operating something and, and trying to feel what something is, you may not be able to distinguish exactly what it is, d depending on what we're trying to achieve. Uh, you know, with, with the visuals, it, it fills it in and really, um, really connects it, and it feels much more realistic. So they're certainly interconnected. Um, taste, for example, you know, people will describe themselves as texture eaters. You know, t taste is, touch is very important to the way we perceive taste. And that's something that if the touch sensation or the haptic sensation is going on in your mouth or wrong, um, it can be a very different uh, report. Like something can be the exact same thing with uh, that it's otherwise being equal. It can be repulsive to us to, to eat uh, depending on, on that um, touch that you're feeling. Um, so, so far, that's been a background about touch and haptics. Um, what does our company, Haptex, do uh, that's, that's different? Um, really, the background of our company started with Jake Rubin. Um, he was the, he's the founder and CEO of the company. He uh, was going to school at Washington University in St. Louis um, on an entrepreneurial scholarship. And oddly enough, he dropped out less than two semesters in to start a company. So it was a, a pretty good entrepreneurial uh, scholarship. <laughs> Uh, he started the company when he was 20 years old, and he had this crazy ambitious vision of a world in which virtual experiences are indistinguishable from real life. And um, oh, by the way, Jake, uh, although he dropped out of college, his, his grandpa worked at MIT for a number of years, so he spent a lot of his early years visiting his, his grandpa's lab, dealing with uh, big robotic devices and magnets and things like that. Um, so I'm, su I'm sure that MIT can um, take some credit for the founding of our company. Um, <laughs> He saw that a lot of people in VR were working on visuals and sound that the, if you think of the going from black and white televisions to the 4K, 3D, <laughs> HDR displays, there's amazing innovation in, um, in visuals and similar with audio. But, but you know, as we were looking at, a lot of the innovation in haptics had been around taking vibrating motors and making them smaller and cheaper and buzzier, uh, but not going for realism and not going for scaling to the full body. So his mission was to bring realistic haptics to the full body, and um, he, he envisioned something like this, a, a full body exoskeleton suit that you can get into and it would just totally recreate the, the virtual world. So it's a pretty, pretty ambitious vision. Uh, to do that, he contacted Dr. Bob Crockett, who's based out of uh, Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo, California. 
Um, Bob is the chair of the biomedical engineering department. He spent a number of years at NASA. Uh, he's worked in the medical device industry and in, um, in early productization of, of uh, medical devices. And Bob also had deep connections uh, to the university, to its, uh, its uh, resources, to its labs, to some of the best and brightest students. And he kind of, Jake and, and Bob partnered to be able to uh, develop a bunch of early proof of concept prototypes uh, at Cal Poly. Um, so they built uh, like lower body exoskeletons that were load bearing, uh, arm force feedback devices, and one of their side projects, and one of their side projects was was this skin material that we'll talk about more in a second that can recreate that sense of tactile feedback and, and vibrational feedback as well. Um, so for the first four years or so of the company, from 2012 to 2016, the company was really a, a research and development company that was looking at and exploring what kind of systems could create full body realistic haptics. And since I've joined the company in 2016 to the present, our focus has been more on taking that research and development and productizing it into gloves. Basically, we took this kind of vision to investors and prospective customers, and they said, that looks amazing. It also looks pretty far off. Um, it'll take a while to develop that. Um, like for instance, how do you make sure that arm doesn't rip somebody's, uh, that, that arm exoskeleton doesn't rip somebody's arm off? And how do you make sure this adopts to multiple sizes? And there are a number of challenges uh, to get to do this. Not impossible challenges, but ones that would require a lot of funding and a lot of time to be able to achieve. But people said, we're really impressed with this underlying haptic technology. Try to miniaturize it and productize it into gloves because we, we can see a market for that today. So for the last few years, that's been our, our, our focus. And we've been kind of going this, undergoing this shift from a research and, de research and development company to being a product company. Um, one of the most, uh, one of, probably the, the most interesting part of our technology stack is this microfluidic skin that we developed. And it's our approach to creating that sense of tactile feedback that we think is really important to touch, uh, and also vib uh, vibrational feedback as well. Um, so each of these uh, little bubbles um, is a, a bladder that we call a, a tactile actuator or a tactor, and it, it can inflate and deflate up to two millimeters uh, to actually give a sense of touch feedback on your skin. Uh, in each of our gloves, there's 130 tactors, so 130 different points of feedback uh, across your fingertips and across your palm. And the reason, the criteria we, we set for adopting this and, and building this was one that we had to provide both localized feedback and high spatial resolution. So this device both needs to be able to be precise in that if I'm touching just on my fingertip, it's only applying to my fingertip, versus, and also be able to apply across my hand if I'm doing a full-handed full grasp. So it had to achieve both of those in a high enough resolution that you're not feeling a lot of gaps. Uh, the other is high displacement. Uh, our, our receptors are about two millimeters beneath our skin, so that's what we uh, that's what we achieved for. And then the reason that it's only two millimeters is that going beyond that, that's when you start to hit those pain receptors or something that could bruise. So you actually don't want to go much beyond that. Um, I'm sorry, are they, are they binary on or off or are they, they have a, a bunch of... That's a, that's a great question. They're, they're actually, so um, it's um, fully displaced, so two millimeters, not at all, and then everything in between. Uh, right now, I think it's, our software does 12-bit, uh, the mechanical, it's continuous because it's a pneumatic actuator, which we'll get more into. They, they can, um, we haven't, so far people can't really tell the difference with 12 bits, but we could do more based on, on software as well. Yeah, 12 bits seems like quite, quite good resolution. Exa exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah. Um, um, so it also has to be lightweight, flexible, and comfortable. These, these, um, um, these panels, one of them kind of goes on this part of the hand, another goes right here, another kind of stretches across this. They go on the fingertips, and that way you can actually bend your hand and have continuous um, contact, right? If, if this was a mechanical device made of, of uh, plastic or metal uh, and it wasn't soft, it would, you wouldn't be able to have full dexterity of your hand. Um, and if you, if you did, it, you couldn't have those actuators uh, um, have a continuous contact point. Um, per Jake's vision, it had to be scalable to the full body. Um, you, it also has to be no perceivable latency in that I can't touch something and then feel it a second and a half later. It has to be sub 50 milliseconds or so. Uh, and it also has to be low cost. Um, these panels themselves are, are made of silicone. They're, they're pretty cheap to produce. Um, and 
we are looking at continuing to drive down the cost of our overall system. And this is a close-up. Um, these ones are, uh, are going fully actuated in a row, um, but they can, this is uh, uh, how they can displace up to two millimeters. And this is a panel that just goes on one fingertip, so I think there's uh, 12 different points of feedback uh, on your fingertip. Um, so when integrating these into gloves, that skin gives a, uh, a that microfluidic skin gives that sense of tactile and vibrotactile across 130 points of feedback. Uh, to provide force feedback, we have a lightweight exoskeleton system that kind of looks like a tendon. It's, it's highlighted here in blue, and this is a braking mechanism that can apply up to four pounds of force per finger. So if I'm grabbing an object, I'm not only feeling that tactile feedback on my hand, I'm feeling force feedback as well. So it's that multimodal effect of having multiple types of haptics to, to better give an illusion. How about weight? That's a great question. So for instance, uh, this is only the gloves. They only apply feedback to the hand, right? So something that is up to five or eight, somewhere between five and eight pounds, it feels like it's most, mostly natural. Your brain fills in the gap. But if I was to you know, lift up a kettlebell or something that's very heavy, um, I'm not getting any feedback on my arms, under my muscles, under my shoulder, under my back. So it wouldn't, it would feel like it was full of helium. It would feel cartoonish. Um, so that's, so weight is something that these gloves themselves, I, really any gloves in, uh, as a standalone can't fully represent. But so we design experiences primarily that don't give a sense of exceeding that eight pound expectation um, with it. Yeah. Um, the other thing is uh, motion tracking. So motion tracking is really important to haptics. Um, if you think of the difference between a hard touch and a soft touch, my hand is probably moving less than a millimeter. Same goes for a non-touch versus a touch itself. You have to have very precise motion tracking. Um, so we looked at a, we, we developed a ma magnetic motion tracking system that has an emitter. So this is illustration, it's kind of illustrating a magnetic field around each hand. Um, and then five sensors, so one for each fingertip that can uh, be referenced based on the, um, uh, the emitter to really track with sub-millimeter accuracy. Um, so really we're tracking uh, 30 degrees of freedom for the hand because it's, it's six degrees of freedom per, per, per finger. Um, and then software, of course, is very important to haptics. Uh, we have plugins for Unreal and Unity so that developers can use familiar tools to make haptic enabled uh, experiences. So kind of looking at our overall technology stack, um, this is all, all the different components in our gloves. And then we're also looking at uh, further research and development. Um, a notable one is into thermal feedback. We have a, um, a big box. Did you, you got to try this at Sundance. Sarah, did you get to try the, the thermal box at Sundance too? Um, it gives um, a sense of both cold uh, and hot thermal feedback. What do you think about it, Sarah? Um, <clears throat> I mean, it worked. Yeah. You felt the warm and the cold. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna play a video uh, from an en engineer. He runs a YouTube channel called Smarter Every Day. This is the first time that we allowed somebody into our lab um, uh, to 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 film and get a genuine reaction to what it's like. Um, these original videos, like so, we posted one that was 20 minutes long and one that was 15 minutes long. You can look them up on YouTube. They're they're really well produced. They have millions of views. Uh, I've cut this one down to five minutes, that, and it kind of expands on some of the things that I've been talking about. Hey, it's me, Destin. Welcome back to Smarter Every Day. We're going to go test drive a virtual haptic glove. It's not virtual. It's an actual haptic glove. But it's a way for you to use your physical body to interact with a virtual world. So what, what's going on here? What do we have? So we have our glove prototype, and we have HTC Vive and a computer to drive the experience. I think you should just try it. Just try it? Yeah. This is the exact moment I realized that they've done something amazing. I'm not a VR believer, but you can actually feel each individual raindrop in your hand. It's not wet or anything like that, but it's perfectly timed, perfectly positioned, and your brain accepts it. I can pick which finger I want it, I want to feel it on. Okay. I feel like a kid. This is pretty cool. Up until this point in the simulation, I'm just feeling things with my hand. But this glove has something called force feedback. If you look on the back of the fingers, there's this tape that can hold your fingers in one position. 
And when I finally picked up a rock, this is the moment where everything clicked. <laughs> all right, all right, cool. <laughs> Yeah, so we love cute animals. This is a cute little box you can feel up for the cool box feet. That is cool mess, man. What's up? It's way cooler than I thought it would be, I'm gonna be honest. I, uh, I thought it would be cool, but it's, it doesn't take long for your brain to just totally engage with it, does it? There's, there's, there's no way this is gonna translate to video. There's, and I'm, I'm totally against VR, just to be, just to be clear. I, I don't think it's going to catch on, but this has changed my mind. That's awesome. Seriously. So go ahead and reach out for that confetti. It should feel a little lighter than anything else you've touched so far. Yes, you're right. It is, it is a continuous actuator. You've got, well, you've got to tell me how you do these bladders. I have to know that. It has to be quick enough where a human can think that they're actually engaged with it. So there is a threshold there. There is a threshold, and they've done studies on it. They found that um, anything longer than a quarter of a second is too long. You, you, you lose the temporal connection between things. But if you get below, like, you know, half that, then you're, you're fine. Yeah, your brain doesn't. We actually call the individual dots factors, and the whole thing is a panel. So we group a bunch of factors together on a panel. It makes it easier to route air to them. It makes it easier to support them. Um, and uh, we can control each of them individually. So this is the spot where the, the research stuff that you have to get into kind of move away from the traditional electrical mechanical engineering and kind of moves into how the brain works. Mm -hmm. uh, it moves into ergonomics, it moves into human factors, and it moves into um, psychometrics. So psychometrics, I don't even know what that means. Uh, it's how people process things, right? It's, it's how your brain works for um, sensation. I don't know if you've ever seen uh, something called the sensory homunculus. It's a picture of a person scaled uh, relative to how many nerve endings they have in different parts of their bodies. Right? It's basically a surface density of your your tactile receptors. Is, it, is that a good way to say it? That's a very good way of saying it. There's also little things like how well does your glove fit? That's why when I put the glove on, it felt like there was, you know, a, a physical thimble that goes on the end of my finger mm -hmm. is because you wanted a tactor to be aligned with my finger just like that, right? Mm -hmm. Is that why? It's because you have to have something to react against. Correct. Is that why you did that? Yep. When you're touching something, it's not just the feedback you feel on your skin, but also the feedback you feel in your joints, your tendons, as you push against it. Adam showed me another demonstrator where a dragon flies across the room, breathes fire on my hand, which I can feel both thermally and like touch, and then it breathes ice on my hand, which felt cold. This was number two? This is number two. You tried number three. Awesome. Awesome. So this is second generation. Okay, so it's just one hand stationary in location. Oh, God, that makes so much sense. If I were to develop this, I would have started at moving the hand in space and then add the haptics to that, but instead you yeah. started with the haptics. So we knew that people could do motion capture. Um, that's been done before. So we wanted to start with the thing that hadn't been done before. Clever. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, that's good. So you guys like Game of Thrones. <laughs> so it's a combination of the tactors firing and temperature control. So you haven't implemented temperature control into not in the glove. The glove does not have thermal. Is that is that a, a goal? I don't think I can talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. That all that stuff actually tricks your brain. It does a really good job of tricking your brain, which I did not expect. And I did not like VR up at this point. Seriously, that's pretty cool. Cool. Yeah, that that video. Um, it was only after he filmed it that we realized he, for whatever reason, wasn't a big fan of the VR experience he, experiences he had tried, and he was prepared to come in and just knock the technology, and he came in very skeptically, like with, with a lot of skepticism, which makes sense. Like, uh, if, if you've only tried other vibration-based devices, you're kind of expecting just a vibration. So we were really happy with how that, that went and that he was actually impressed with what we were doing. Um, so that's the technology. Uh, I'm gonna move on to applications, but are, are there any other questions about our technology or how that works? I yeah. was just wondering about the tech. Clearly, they're tethered. Yeah. And it seems like they're tethered with this massive cable, cable. that goes somewhere. And it's yeah. going to some huge. 
you know, gaming, yeah. you know, desktop that requires massive, I mean, what's, yep. what are you talking about? I mean, I assume, obviously, you want to get into the point where it's, not tethers, probably. Absolutely. Yeah, so, so the tether is, is a big trade-off. You know, there is, with any, um, um, with, with the approach of pneumatics, of, of sending compressed air to inflate these, what's good is that it's relatively lightweight on your hand, but, but the downside is we can't um, send air wirelessly, at least not yet. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and so we, what we do is we, we designed an uh, air compressor that sits underneath a, a desk or a, a table. Um, it's silent. It cleans the air as well. It, it, uh, exactly. So we, we looked at a bunch of off-the-shelf air compressors, and they're all too noisy or too big. So we had to actually design one ourselves, uh, which is a theme at our company. We're looking for existing things. We'd rather do things off the shelf, uh, but they're not good enough for what we need. So we have to make it ourselves. Um, too much pressure, though. How much PSI? That does 30 psi. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, continuously, and that's all. That's all our system needs. Um, that that. Um, uh, that video was shot a little over a year ago, um, and we now have a two-glove system. The tethers become a lot uh, thinner and longer, so somebody, well, the stress test we use is a guy named Johnny at our company. He's six foot six. He can go like this and, and full, full dexterity, so it's still standing or seated or near this device, um, but uh, he has full dexterity of, or in, in full, a full range of motion. Um, the reason there's a, a box on the table is that it, it's not actually a traditional computer. It's really a, a pneumatic computer. It's got a series, it's got an array of valves. So if we have 130 actuators per hand, that's um, 130 valves for each of those. That's 260 total in this box. So what we're doing is we're working to reduce the, the valves that we use right now. They're off the shelf. They're actually overpowered for what we need. So we're reducing the size of those a lot. Um, we're getting the the size of the box, which is now like 42 pounds, we're getting it down to like nine pounds, something that could be worn as a backpack or something like that. Um, and what's great is the closer, the shorter the distance is from this box to, to your hand, the lower power you need. The, the, less, the, the longer the tubes are, the further you need to send air with no latency, the more high powered it needs to be, the more area there is for the air to get lost, um, the bigger the valve needs to be. Well, as you get closer and closer to your hand, you can make those valves a lot smaller and smaller. That involves some custom valve making and things like that. But we have, a, that's a very long way of saying we have a number of different pathways we can get to going essentially tetherless um, or much more, getting much more mobility. Wow, that's yeah. Cool. <laughs> um, other, other things about uh, technology or do you want to save them for the end? I'll, I'll keep going on to applications. So um, because of this, um, because of these, these shortcomings in terms of the trade-offs with, with using pneumatics and using um, uh, a lot of new technology that basically puts us at a higher price point than a standard you know, VR controller. Um, and we're really targeting enterprise applications. And it's great because there's been a lot of enterprise adoption of VR technologies. Um, a really great use case for VR is automotive design. Um, if you look on the left here, Designers still uh, sculpt cars out of clay, and they, they do build a bunch of physical prototypes uh, before they get to a um, production version of a car model. Um, any new car design, any new model design, requires dozens and dozens of physical prototypes that are all costly. They, they build something physical, they have to, uh, that takes weeks or months. They fly executives from around the world to get feedback. As soon as they implement any feedback, that design is now obsolete and it's, and it's outdated. Um, and each of these, expen these, these um, physical prototypes, depending on its sophistication, costs hundreds of thousands to close to a million bucks to produce. So obviously they're trying to make that not physical but digital, you know, move, move from atoms to moving to bits uh, so they can use VR for these, um, uh, for these prototypes. Now the thing with VR though is if you want to get a sense of the driver's experience um, and you want to operate the steering wheel, you want to uh, adjust buttons, um, open a glove compartment. Well, if you're holding controllers, all of those interactions feel like the exact same thing. They feel like you're holding a piece of plastic, pulling triggers, pressing AB buttons. Um, so using your hands, a glove allows you to get a, a real um, natural range of motion in that environment. So your, your hands are doing uh, what you would expect to do inside of the car. Um, one of the car makers we're working with, we're working with a number of them, but what I'm allowed to talk about publicly is Nissan. They've really um, uh, accelerated their adoption of, of VR and haptic gloves in their design. And uh, I can sh I'm going to share a video and I'll speak over it of 
how Nissan is, um, is using our gloves. So, so this is the Nissan Leaf, and this is the first project we did with them. And what Nissan, you know, they were skeptical of how close can we get to simulating the, the real interior of a car. So we started with one of their existing cars. Our engineers actually went inside and touched everything inside the Leaf and got a sense for what it felt like. And then we recreated it. They sent us over a CAD model and we made it touchable and interactable within the game engine. And when we shared it with their, their team, their design team, they're just thrilled at how, how close we can get it. You know, it's not one-to-one -one of being in the car, but it's close enough to give them a real sense of the driver's experience. So this one's the Nissan IMS, and this is a concept car that actually doesn't exist yet. They, they announced it just in January of this year. And now what you can do is, is touch a car before it's been manufactured. You, we can you know, take this CAD model, uh, make it touchable, and their designers can then get a better a sense of the driver's experience and make a bunch of design decisions in a virtual prototype instead of having to use a number of physical prototypes. Um, you know, physical prototyping will still exist in the process, but even if we can take them from, say, a dozen physical prototypes down to 10, we've saved them, you know, uh, potentially millions of dollars uh, and hopefully it helped them make better design decisions along the way. So the same goes for, for any, auto, other, any other automaker or really any kind of vehicle design, uh, aerospace, aviation, uh, and other types of, of, um, of vehicles. Um, so, so that's kind of how we're working with, uh, with designers. Um, another application for us is training, uh, especially like in industrial training. You know, training right now kind of have two options. You can either do live training uh, to use like a, a, a pilot um, aviation example. A, a, a live training exercise would be flying a real um, aircraft, um, and that can be expensive or dangerous or complex. Um, um, you know, most of the uh, fatalities in the military in the last few years have been in training exercises rather than um, uh, actual combat scenarios. So it's a real problem across a number of industries. Sim similarly, for uh, there's a energy company we're working with where they have to train a lot of electrical line workers. And if you make a mistake the first time on your job, you could be electrocuted and seriously injured or maybe killed. So you really want to get the right kind of uh, training there, but, but live training can be dangerous. Um, the other... Um, the other uh, um, side of training is virtual training. And virtual training is the phrase they use for any type of, of digital uh, training experience, not just virtual reality, but, but, um, but, but video or video game or other kind of things. Um, and even if you're using VR in a virtual training experience, you may be building the wrong type of muscle memory. You may be holding controllers or going through interactions in a way where, where you actually um, it results in something called negative training, where you have to actually unlearn what you've learned because you've learned the wrong type of, of muscle memory. So what we're trying to do is bridge that gap between virtual training and, li and live training, kind of making virtual reality feel more, more real so you can um, have more cost-effective, repeatable, uh, safer training techniques. Um, this uh, top one is an example. We worked with the, uh, a fire department in California to make a uh, pump panel training simulation. So um, you can operate the um, a really intimidating looking dashboard, um, you know, adjusting knobs and, and going through a routine uh, while a fire is happening. So, so you can um, have a sense of, of, of pressure that, that I need to go through these tasks or this building will burn down. And you can use your hands naturally to, to go through the right hand motions in VR. Uh, this image down here is from a, uh, a company we worked with called Fundamental VR. They're a uh, surgery trainer that's, that focuses on uh, orthopedic surgery. And so we have a, a um, kneecap um, um, surgery simulator with them. Um, they, they had previously worked in like that, those pen-based haptic devices and they found them limiting. So when they tried our gloves, they were very excited to try that. And we recently had an event and we demoed this to a number of orthopedic surgeons and it doesn't feel like an actual, you know, a bone doesn't feel exactly like bone. The, the uh, soft tissue doesn't feel exactly like, like real skin, but it's much, much better than what the uh, kind of training uh, scenarios they had done previously. And it's, uh, and it's good enough to help them make better, um, um, uh, better decisions while they're training in virtual reality. Um, 
And this is one of the most exciting applications, uh, which is Telerobot, Teller Um This is um, a very new one for us. Um, we partnered with a couple companies. One is Shadow Robot Company. They make a dexterous robotic hand, uh, and it basically just is a, a, ro a robot hand that can really simulate or, or recreate the positions of a, a, of a real human hand. And then we um, partnered with Syntouch, which makes um, these really sophisticated biotech sensors, and they can sense tactile feedback. And what happens was when we, when we put this little thing on the fingertips of the robot, we can use our glove to control the robotic hand. Um, the robotic hand can pick something up, and those sensors can detect touch sensation, which can then uh, relay that feedback back to the operator who feels the touch sensation of the robot um, in, in the gloved hand. So if you're asking, can a robot feel touch? Well, yeah, now it can, and you can feel what the robot feels. Um, I'm gonna play some video of, of this in action. Um, what you're seeing is my colleague, Mike, he's, he just picked up a, a few different cups, and based on that touch, he can release the bottom cup while keeping the top cup as well. And that's something that can only be achieved because of that touch sensation, uh, stacking cups the right way. Um, we're fast forwarding it a, a bit to just kind of see how, how this works. Um, so one of the bigger challenges he has is, is more about his perspective, that he's, he's having to operate something from kind of an unnatural distance. So, so our company and, and, and Shadow and Syntouch, we're working on solving this touch and, and manipulation, but there are a number of other companies that are working on, um, on visual systems that can capture um, high resolution uh, 180 or 3D uh, video and then play that back with no latency. What was amazing about this is that this is only the second time that this whole system was together. Most of the system was done with our engineers in California and our glove in California, and then the robotic hand based in London. And so we just went over Skype calls and were able to kind of learn how to control the robot from halfway across the world. Um, we put this together in, uh, in Tokyo. Yeah, these people are very brave. Uh, doing this. Um, the guy back there, his name's Tony, he has an emergency stop that his foot is on, so in case the robot hand goes wild or there's some data loss, he's not going to smack anybody in the face. He's got a watch going on. Yeah. He's cracking up. <laughs> yeah. So we did this, so this is sponsored by a company called a, &A. Uh, They're a, um, uh, a big airline uh, based out of uh, Japan, and it's part of the, it's affiliated with the Avatar X Prize, which is, um, the X Prize is um, a group that has a, a handful of challenges that are, are very ambitious, but their they're, um, hope is to motivate teams to take on um, ambitious challenges and, and further technology development. So this, this X Prize is for building avatars that can have you know, full, a full range of human dexterity and can be operated from afar. And these, these are different challenges that were kind of brought to us. Um, a, a company in Japan brought this because they wanted to see how strong can the robot hand be. In this one, Michael is blindfolded and he just picked up that ball with only the sense of touch and no, no sense of uh, sight. And of course we had to try typing. Um, so there, there are just a number of applications for telerobots, basically any place where you don't want to send a human. Um, it could be um, some place that's dangerous, um, like say the aftermath of some sort of uh, nuclear um, fallout or um, you know, some sort of a disaster situation. It could be a place that's expensive, like space or underwater. So it could be a place that's complex, like deep under the ocean, um, or some combination of the above. Is he adjusting to the time that the robotic arm takes to move from the human to the A little bit. So in that one, let me see if I can come back to that. Because you can see he has to go really slowly. Yeah. So part of it is he's kind of typing at a keyboard from a three-foot distance mm -hmm. um, in a place where he's kind of, he has to kind of, his, he, this is uh, Jeremy. He's with Syntouch. Um, he was have, Jeremy was having issues seeing the keys. So, but of course there's also the sense of, um, um, so there's the visual problem. There's also, um, 
you know, this, this robot was, because it's only one hand that's integrated right now, um, you know, we're not, it's not quite touch typing. It's, well, I mean, there is touch typing that feels touch, but it's not as quick as, as you would otherwise be. Uh, there are also some issues with the position of the hand kind of going like this versus being rested where, where it naturally would be. Um, if, if he had his own keyboard to type on and the robot had that, another keyboard to type on, if you move one of the keyboards a little bit so his sense of touch would be off compared to what the robot was touching, would he get motion sickness like if you do it with VR glasses or...? Yeah, um, so to understand the scenario, he's, he's got a VR headset on but he's not like seeing where his real hands are. We, we can give people most motion sickness by sending signals through glasses that doesn't correspond with uh, yeah. the senses. And, and can you do that as well with these kinds of... Ab absolutely. Well, I imagine there are a number of ways we can induce mo motion sickness if we wanted to. Um, I'm not entirely sure with... Um, so so the, the research into um, live, real-time, visual streaming into a VR headset, that's something that other folks are working on, and I frankly haven't... Uh, tried that or spoken to our engineers as much about that component of it. I, I would suspect that motion, most of the motion sickness would have to do with the visual system um, and not matching up to your, your real position and less so to your hand's position. Does that sound about right? I don't know. That's, but that's the question. Is it dissonance yeah. but, of any kind? Or yeah. Yeah. Just but, but actually, proprioception that leads to motion sickness, the lack of proprioce accurate proprioception, is 10% eyesight, 20% your inner ear, and 70% muscle memory. Okay. So it's interesting, interesting to know that it might not just be touch, it might actually more be more position of your body, your, yeah. or legs, or your feet. Uh, but that is how, in creating VR, sometimes we counterbalance motion sickness, things that make you feel motion sickness. My cue is always to have the user move, and that usually resolves motion sickness. Uh, my best example for this is just like if you ever go on a boat, on a fishing boat, uh, when you're really sick or like seasick, they'll tell you just jump into the sea and swim. But because the, the fact that you're moving your body kind of helps your entire visual and vestibular system readjust to your I think body. That's just they want you. Okay. They want you off. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they go throw up out there in the ocean. <laughs> <on them>. <laughs> <laughs> but it actually works. It's a great way to get rid of motion sickness. And same in VR, so every problem that we've had with motion sickness in VR experiences, we use the body and muscle memory. So the fact that you're also using muscle memory with hands, maybe mm -hmm. in a bigger, the interesting part I think of this discussion is also maybe uh, the bigger scale of the full body suit yeah. uh, could help you induce motion sickness or really. Maybe not just through hands, because it's really yeah. muscle memory of the entire position of your body. Yeah. <laughs> but the fact, fact that, you, that you, you have thought about this much suggests that you have not come up against any anything that your device does that makes people feel this kind of dissonance. Yeah, we. Uh, I've spent a handful of hours in the telerobot system. I haven't ever uh, experienced motion sickness myself. The the more frustrating thing is when the system is together um, that you have to imagine your hand as if it were in that robot hands position so in that scenario it's it's like imagining my arm being really really long but still controlling my hand right here so that's there's some uh, mental exercises to make that connection uh, it does, it's not motion sickness but it is like some some frustration you'll notice like the examples that we had were really about the dexterity of say like a toddler or something they, um, we've only been working on this for five or six months or so so we're, we're glad that we at, at, at all that we've achieved, but we do still have a long way to go on that. It's still very early. Um, the other thing is that because most of the development was done um, with the robotic hand in the UK and, and us in California, um, we had to go over Skype to do video. And because video is much higher bandwidth, um, you know, all, all the pixels, all the audio, much more information being sent over video, we'd actually experience latency, but we wouldn't experience latency with the touch um, we'd experience it with the visuals. So, so we'd, you'd reach out and touch something and you'd feel it before you see yourself touching it and feeling it. And we actually had to introduce latency at times and get those things calibrated so it felt more natural. Um, if you, if you um, want to read more about it, we, we shared this with Wired Magazine uh, with their, their robotics reporter, Matt Simon, 
uh, at their office in San Francisco. And we ran this uh, over a 4G network. We couldn't connect for security reasons to their Wi-Fi. So, um, so we used one of our employees' uh, personal cell phone and just went over that and, and uh, sent it to, controlled this tactile telerobot off of a Verizon 4G network. Um, uh, so it's, it doesn't require a lot of data. We imagine that better networking systems, though, will have to, we'll, we'll be able to both decrease the latency for video and for a, a telerobot system like ours. Uh, I was, I'm interested in what role you think uh, like a, a disability studies perspective might be able to bring to some of these technologies. Because I think, uh, it's, it's my question with a lot of VR technologies as well, um, I think you said the mission had something to do with uh, recreating reality. And I think that usually translates to like a particular class of person's reality. So in this case, for example, it's like the reality of someone who uh, can use a highlighter with like very fine control, um, which assumes a lot about like grip strength, dexterity, arm, hand, a lot of things. Um, so I was wondering what room you see in the development of technologies like this to kind of not recreate some of the same barriers to entry as design of some products that already exist. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a, that's a huge topic, and there are kind of a number of ways where this could play into it. Um, one interesting thing with design, uh, and automotive design, that I, I didn't speak about, is that the designers actually want, it, it enables them to feel a different sense of empathy with their end user, where a, um, one of Nissan's designers, for instance, could scale up the car to feel like they're smaller, like a, they're a, a five foot tall person, or scale it down to feel like they're seven feet tall. And they can make decisions based on um, that perspective and the experience of their, um, of their drivers that don't necessarily fit their own size. And it would never have been possible to do that with, with physical prototypes. So like, no, they're not going to build an extra small car for just one designer to feel. Uh, but it's much easier to do that in VR. Uh, similarly, we, uh, full disclosure, we haven't tested this yet, but we think there are a number of ways where you could be able to intentionally limit the mobility of the hand avatar um, and potentially recreate what it is like for somebody differently able uh, in, that, in that experience. And, and you can use this to make um, better uh, vehicles in mind, design them in mind for a differently abled uh, customer or driver. Um, when it comes to our, our gloves themselves, I think what we're trying to do is to build a tool uh, that ultimately, while, while some of this content we've developed ourselves, we don't really think of ourselves as a content company. What we want to do is get this into the hands of a number of uh, customers and, and researchers and developers who can um, explore, uh, use this as a tool to address if they're, if they're interested in researching um, experiences for the differently abled, that they can use this as a tool for, for their own uh, purposes in that. Um, it is, uh, frankly, it also goes into what is it that we make and, and sizing and fitting and things like that. Because if you think of a, a VR headset, a single size device can fit a wide range of the population. Um, I think to the 99th percentile, a, a single size headset um, you know, with some IPD adjustments and things like that, it's, it's able to address a wide number of people. But when it comes to gloves, we always kind of joke that ours is one size fits most. That we intentionally made our development kit gloves to be on the larger size uh, because we can always fit a smaller sized hand into a larger sized glove, but we can't do the reverse. If we had a small sized glove, uh, if we tried to give it to a, a larger person, uh, they could potentially break it and stretch it or, and, and make it unusable, which would be harmful. So for things like gloves, different sizing is really important. That if you look at like a high performance golf glove, there's 12 different sizes um, from extra small to extra, extra large for men and women. Um, and for a product company that it's a lot easier to do that with gloves than it is with technology. Uh, having different miniaturization means di using different um, um, different components. Um, it adds a lot of complexity to it. Um, so frankly, as this technology becomes more immersive, um, there are a lot of different challenges with it. And then what do we do for people whose hands may not be shaped as the norm? Are they are they missing um, digits? Are they are, are like it's those are questions that frankly we we haven't had to answer yet, but it would have to uh, come up eventually. 
Yeah. How do you see your device being utilized by filmmakers in the creation of their own films? Because you said you're not a content uh, company, so I'm wondering how can the technology be utilized positively by filmmakers or content producers? F filmmakers like traditional 2D film or th yeah. 3D filmmakers? Uh, yeah. Um, w frankly, I think that market is so. The reason that we've talked about like design and and um, and training and, and tele robotics and things like that is is what I like to think of it as kind of a, a bowling pin strategy. We're we're going for one market first, learning what that customer needs, then going to the next one, then the next one, and then many more. Um, so filmmaking, I, I I can kind of speculate as to what the uses might be, but it, it is a bit further off for us. Uh, what, what I've heard, like when we were at Sundance, we did, I got to demo to a lot of different filmmakers, and you know they dream of. You see um, Minority Report, you know, the very famous gloves in that movie of using nonlinear editing, to piecing things together in three dimensions. Uh, that kind of vision is very appealing to a number of people. And I think gloves uh, and VR and, and operating in 3D environments versus these 2D ones could, could give people a, a number of tools. Um, also in the uh, potential layout or staging of scenes using, using gloves and more kind of natural forms of input uh, could be a way of, of doing different types of, of set design or, or um, uh, different types of construction within, within filmmaking. Um, maybe also using them as motion capture for, for actors, uh, capturing their, their data and positions and with things like, with things like their hands. Th those are kind of me just speculating as to how it might be used, but I'm sure that as we develop and actually share more with them, uh, we could hear more ideas around it. I think it was also interesting at Sundance to see how it opened up possibilities of how to create immersive content. So two different approaches. Uh, previously, we've had a, as guests DV Group. DV Group had experiences where it, it is a VR experience, but it's inspired by immersive theater. But they had kind of grass, like if, imitation of grass, uh, you know, little holes that you need to peek into, or like this uh, meringue uh, mushroom shape because you're supposed to eat a mushroom and to, to have you like that sensation of feeling of your mouth and tactile, etc. So that's one way to, to do it. They have virtual content, but you're exploring through your hands, sense of smell, sense of taste, uh, different things. Uh, for me, experiencing the, the demo you presented at Sundance really goes to show how easy your brain goes into fooling itself and getting into that kid stage-like mode of discovering something you haven't experienced before, just the tactile, the tactile uh, compressions of your finger while you're picking up objects or seeing that little fox on your hand, suddenly you really feel it's a different way of exploring storytelling as well. Uh, heat or cold, you know, it's it's not the same as, let's say, DV Group with their imitation of a VR world that you see virtually, but you do have like uh, fake plants and grass that you can touch with your actual hands and fingers, so you're using everything about your hands and touch. Uh, but in this case, you kind of understand that you're getting fooled. Mm -hmm. and there's something mesmerizing about that as well. The feeling of this is purely virtual. I know I'm not picking it up, but I do feel weight. Yeah. So it's, it's really a strange sensation. But it, for me, it opened up, oh, wow, we could tell all sorts of stories. You know, you could make yourself tiny, make yourself huge, and have that different notion of, you know, does that weight a lot? The same feather that was supposed to be lightweight, suddenly you're changing the experience, and now it's really super heavy. There's like all these touch force feedback sensations, heat and cold that open up like new ways of storytelling as well. Absolutely. One of our engineers, he describes it as really, really hard science, or 50% is really, really hard science. The other 50% is magic trick. That you're, you, a lot of the, they, they can study what it's like, what does it take to be one to one? Um, what is physically happening? What would we need to do to your hand? But then the interesting question is how wrong can we get it while still having you believe that you're uh, feeling that object. Um, and there are, it's also so individualized, there's not like one rule for all the objects and touch interactions that's out there. It's something that we're still learning a lot about. In the back there? Yeah. So whenever these come to market, I assume they're, they're not gonna be very cheap, at least on the consumer. So, no. um, and also, you know, presumably you have some competitors. So it, how difficult is it for developers to make these kind of textures and integrate it into their games? Like if Nissan's spending a lot of effort trying to Right, yeah. Um, because they're going to be so few, right? If you want them like in games, right, they presumably have to have some high AAA standard or something that's like easy to make these kind of you know, feelings. Absolutely. Um, 
a, a lot to unpack there. The, the first is, yeah, when it comes to market, the, the lower volume your units, the, the more it's going to cost. And we, I'd, I'd kind of liken it to Tesla's history of their first you know, car that you could buy as the Roadster, and it's only for the very elite. Mm -hmm. and, and that the Model S is still probably out of, um, you know, it's, it's lower price, but still a very premium car. And then the Model 3 is probably still a medium car, but it's within, you know, the mid-range that, you know, you could purchase it. And, and ours is kind of a similar situation where the first ones, uh, uh, hopefully not as pricey as a Tesla Roadster, but, but still um, something that is primarily for enterprise, primarily for industrial use, um, um, for, a, you know, a car maker and, you know, the, we're, we're relatively cheap to uh, a physical prototype of a car, you know, that the value we're adding is it's uh, much less, these gloves are much less costly than building a, a you know, $100,000 prototype. Um, but, but it's, you know, the, the price is driven by how much we're saving them. Um, when it comes to developers, so yeah, um, we don't want to be a content company. We do some of that in-house to kind of hold the hands of early customers along the way. But everything we do is, is using the familiar tools and the familiar interface of Unity and Unreal. Um, we did you know, some coding. We have a low-level low C++ API for something like integrating a Teller robot, but most of our customers probably aren't doing that right now. Um, what we do is we communicate with the physics engine of each game engine. So there's a very simple single-click thing where it says enable, uh, enable haptics, and it takes the physical mesh, the physical mesh of objects and you can immediately touch things based on that. Now, once you do that, there's a lot of, that makes everything haptic enabled almost immediately. But within that, there's a lot of fine tuning that needs to happen depending on what your interaction is. For instance, if I'm doing a, a button click, um, that button click is not simply touching a solid object, it's, it's touching a solid object that is then changing and, and impacting a different solid object, and th that reaction is then being fed back to your hand. Right, and so what we have is a, what we call a number of haptic primitives. Think of them as kind of like drag and drop templates where we've created a number of different button type things and you can drag and drop it onto the, your buttons in your, in your uh, VR experience and you can simulate that um, into your hand. And then if we have the tools to make you develop this, this new type of button. And the same kind of goes to different things like textures as well. Uh, within texture, right now our gloves, you can't tell the difference between one type of felt and another type of felt or or uh, uh, one type of leather to another type, but you can tell the difference between, between say, like sandpaper or glass, right? That, that there are things where we can tell the, um, the roughness versus smoothness. And that's kind of how sophisticated it is now. Of course, we'd love to get better than that, but, but frankly, it's, that, that'll just take more time. Um, and so there are pretty um, simple kind of parameters we can apply onto different things. And then we can also give developers the tools to make haptic animations where um, if something is uh, like for that's how we use vibrations, for instance, when we do that, if, if you're holding the car and the engine's engaged and it's running, you can apply an effect to give that that sense of run the, the vehicle running. And, and it's not just the, that you're holding the steering wheel, but that the steering wheel is being impacted by the engine of the car. Um, and, and so there are a number of things kind of depending on what the experience is where we can give developers those tools. And what's great with all those is that we just need to make those once, you know, somebody needs to do the hard coding once and then it can be replicated a thousand times in a thousand different demos. Andrew. Uh, yeah. yeah, the, a lot of this stuff is VR. Are you thinking about AR applications or MR stuff? Yeah, so it's one that we get asked about a lot. And um, the answer is because we integrate with the game engine and, and Unity and Unreal, we could. Yeah. Um, the way that we approach a lot of this, though, is, is we always look for customer-funded research and development. So we look for a customer who really wants that to happen, and then we make it happen for them. And that kind of gets us to build it for a customer's use case, and then we can take what we learn and apply it to other things down the line. And that's one where um, simply that hasn't happened yet, and we're perfectly open to that. Um, it's, it's something we're very interested in, but... We're also, we're very curious about a number of things. Um, in VR, because your, your real world is occluded, your, uh, your hand does not necessarily have to look like it's gloved or that you're wearing a glove. Um, you could either, and um, in MR, you'd, you'd be seeing that you're wearing a glove. And I honestly, I don't know how much does that break the illusion of I see this glove that I'm wearing and I'm feeling things below it and I might see something virtual laid on top of it. Um, I don't know the answer of, of how 
how immersive that is. Um, I, I have a feeling that it will work, but we don't really know until we try that. Any other questions? Um, I'm going to stick around as long as people are want to talk. So if there are other if there are other things, feel free to come up, and I can talk about this all day. So. Thanks, everybody.